Hello, I'm Carl Seibert. Thanks for joining me. This video is a companion to our last video in which we talked about considerations before embarking upon publishing images under a Creative Commons license. Specifically, how to use metadata to strengthen our Creative Commons works. Well, we're still considering things. In this installment, we're considering that link that we have to have or ask for on our Creative Commons work back to the original work. If you remember, last time we talked, we created this Creative Commons picture and we'd marked it up with metadata. And in our caption and a couple other fields in our metadata, we asked the eventual user of this picture to please provide a link back to the original picture. And that kind of looked like this here. And then we put the picture on a web page in the role of the user of a Creative Commons picture. And we saw that very quickly we could change that sort of awkward parenthetical note in our caption into a link in the attribution that would take a visitor to a place where they could find an original copy of the picture. Now we'll talk about what an original file of the picture is in a couple of minutes because that too isn't as clear as it might possibly be. But at the moment, we have the question of where are we gonna put this thing? And as you can see, I opted to make a page on my own website, which is obviously something that's made a little easier by the fact that I have a website. And on that page, I can post Creative Commons pictures in full resolution and people can download them. Hosting my own page, provides a couple of advantages for me. One is that the URL of the page is something very simple and easy. Another is that that URL doesn't change until I get so many pictures on this page that it would be unreasonable to expect anyone to find a particular one, I can use the same URL, which means I can put it in my metadata templates and I just don't ever have to worry about it. If I release a picture, under Creative Commons, all I have to do is post it on this page and my Creative Commons template is already going to be set up to point people to that picture. So that's really great. But again, it's easy for me to say because I have a website on which to do this. Now I might add at this point that if you're using or publishing a Creative Commons picture that came from somebody else, you really don't have these concerns. All you have to do is make sure that you link back to where you got it or that you link back to where the original creator asked you to and you don't have to worry about it anymore. But let's say we don't have a handy website page on which to host the picture. Where can we put it? Well, there are two places where people often look for Creative Commons pictures. One is good old Flickr. Now, anybody who's ever used Flickr knows that there's a touch of irony when I refer to it that way, because if you use Flickr, you'll have a love-hate sort of a relationship with the site if it's not hate-hate. There are many things that are wrong or inconvenient or otherwise just aren't quite right about Flickr, but it has 200 million Creative Commons images in its database. Its search engine works pretty good if you give it something to go on. Its metadata is indexed by Google, not in the sense of metadata from files being indexed by Google. We don't actually think that Google does that. But Flickr pages, which do contain the metadata from your image, are indexed by Google, and that's a good thing. And Flickr itself has pretty strong support for Creative Commons built in. It's easy when you upload a picture to Flickr, to tell Flickr that it is in fact a Creative Commons picture, to tell it which license, and you're good to go. Now, downsides to Flickr include the fact that it's, by, it's been owned in the last little while by just about everybody except you and me. And I don't know about you, but I don't have the best confidence ever that it's going to be around for a really long time. And that's one of the things that we want to look for when we're seeking a place to host our pictures. We want it to be archival. We want our Creative Commons works to live a long and productive life in society. 
Another downside to Flickr is that metadata is only supported on the largest, what Flickr calls the original size version of your photo. The other four renditions, the smaller ones, are stripped of metadata. This would not be a good thing for a Creative Commons picture. It's not a good thing for any picture, but it's not going to help us in the slightest for Creative Commons because once a picture is separated from the page it's originally published on, without metadata, there's no way for a future user to know that it's a Creative Commons picture and to be able to use it properly. So we really want our metadata preserved wherever we host our images. And in the case of Flickr, that's only going to be on this original size image, which is exactly the image that you upload. Now, that said, here what I've done on Flickr is create this page, which is an album in Flickr speak, and I've put a subhead, a legend, in my headline to tell people to please download only the original size. Only the original will include metadata. And then on each original, or excuse me, on each photo that I post on the page, I have also included a comment under the caption that says the same thing. Please download only the original size. Now that's kind of a pain in the neck because that's something that I have to do for every picture that I upload to Flickr. But I can live with it. It's not going to be that many pictures and Hopefully people will get the idea, and I sort of like to believe that downloaders are sensible enough to take the best quality version of the picture that they can. If we look at the URLs on Flickr, those are pretty unfriendly, and they're pretty long. That's a drawback. URL shorteners, probably a non-starter. They're mistrusted. Some people don't allow them on their websites. Other people won't use them. And who knows how long they will or won't be around. If you have your own website and you're blessed with the ability to create redirects, you can redirect from your own website to this album on Flickr. And that's a possibility. Once again, a possibility only if you have your own website. And a variant on the idea of using Flickr or something like it is to use a professional portfolio site like Zenfolio or Photo Shelter, and host your Creative Commons pictures there. You'll find their metadata support to be better. Most of them have pretty good search engines, but they're not places where people will go necessarily to look for Creative Commons images. Although in most of those sites, you can specify that your pages be indexed by Google. And of course, one of the big things is you simply have to pay for them, and you might not want to do that. By the way, Flickr's most current owner, as I tape this in May of 2018, is SmugMug, which is, in fact, one such professional photo sharing site. And there are many more. Now, another place, perhaps to me the preeminent place, where people go to look for Creative Commons pictures is Wikimedia Commons. Now, Wikimedia Commons is a curated site, and that's a good thing. That keeps the noise level down a little bit. And by the way, let's edit before we upload. Upload a reasonable selection of images of any given subject. Let's don't spam our archive site. Additionally, we should note that Wikimedia Commons doesn't support all of the Creative Commons licenses. Basically, the buy license and the buy share alike license are the only ones that are supported here. So the reason we're not looking at a Wikimedia Commons page with that flower picture that we used as a test subject is that I released that flower picture under a different Creative Commons license. It's not supported here, and so, oops, I can't post it on Wikimedia Commons. When people upload here, they're prompted to enter pretty good information about the license, about themselves, and with any luck at all, a reasonable caption. 
Wikimedia Commons prompts users to enter a caption when they upload pictures. And generally, there will be a minimal but fairly utilitarian caption on Wikimedia Commons pictures. That's a good thing. And they're very clear about the license in the metadata that they provide on the pictures page. Now, Wikimedia Commons has the very same limitation that Flickr does in that only the full resolution in Wikimedia Commons terminology version of the picture includes metadata. And apart possibly from putting it in your caption, you're going to have a hard time alerting people to that fact. I, in fact, thought that Wikimedia Commons didn't support metadata at all, because in all the pictures that I've downloaded from here, until a rather recent one, I never found a stitch of metadata. So that's a problem. We can see on the URL front that the URLs are pretty compact and they're human friendly. So that's not a bad thing. So Wikimedia Commons, which by the way hosts about 50 million Creative Commons images, remains a good option for hosting our Creative Commons pictures, and it could be a target for that link that we're seeking from our users. Now let's take a look at the matter of what the original file needs to be. A photo morphs through several different variations as it goes through its life cycle. Photos are, I guess, born when they come out of a camera or some other device as a sort of a raw, unprocessed file. Now that could be an actual camera raw file, which is the original data from the camera's imaging sensor, or it could be a processed file that has been robotically toned and color corrected and perhaps even had really sophisticated operations like pseudo HDR applied to it, and then saved in a common format like JPEG or TIFF. So here we're looking at such a raw file, and this is in fact a camera raw file. We are in a raw converter. This particular one is on one photo raw, and we see our test image of the flower. Now, are you my original file? No, uh, absolutely not. This is a proprietary file format. This one is a Nikon NEF file. It's absolutely enormous. And it's probably not what we want this file to be. So typically at this point, we would work on this photo a little bit. And we'll make some global settings. And we'll make some local adjustments to the color and tones of the picture. And obviously I'm not doing this really carefully, but you kind of get the idea. You know, we'll just... We'll do a little bit of darkening of this background and we'll make these colors a little bit richer and you know, we'll make this photo our own work. Neatness matters, so we'll crop it as well. There we go. Whoa, hello. As I was saying, neatness matters. So there we have a crop. Now, we can export this version of the photo to some sort of a lossless file format, like this TIFF, for example, and we've created what we could call a master version of the image. This is a very normal workflow that photographers do all the time. Conversely, if we're working in a non-destructive editor like this one or a Lightroom, we could leave the image right here and call it the master image even though there is no actual image file made of this picture yet, all we have here is the original camera file and some XML data that tells us what edits we made to the file so that we can essentially make them again on export. We can call this the master, and we could export from here any file type we like. We could, for instance, export a compressed JPEG of this file and for the sake of argument, we could call that a distribution master. 
let's say we're making the file to distribute to the media or to send in for publication or to release under Creative Commons, and this is probably about what we want it to look like. Most of the time, your distribution copy of a photo is going to be a JPEG, it's going to be minimally compressed, and it's going to have the edits on the photo that you want to see in the finished work. That said, there are arguments that lean in the other direction. Some people might want the distributed version of the photo to be more like the original and allow an eventual user more latitude to tone the image and shape it as he or she would like. And that's something that you need to think about in advance. I will add here that radical destructive edits, like making the picture oversaturated or over sharpening the picture, or perhaps even sharpening the picture at all, will be destructive further down the work further down the workflow for other users. In the case of sharpening, for example, sharpening destroys detail. It imparts illusion of more detail. It makes detail more noticeable. But in reality, it destroys it. Then when we change the size of a photo, we essentially erase the beneficial effects of sharpening, and we're left with the negative effects of sharpening. On the other hand, we want our pictures to look spiffy and bright and attractive. So there are some trade-offs that we have to consider in advance. And for what it's worth, my recommendation on sharpening, depending on the sensor type on your camera and whether or not it has an anti-aliasing filter, is a light sharpening at a very small radius will make your picture more attractive on the screen to an eventual user who needs to choose your picture or some other picture, but won't cause too much trouble further on in pre-press or in preparation for use on a website. That's my two cents about sharpening. But the point here is that about all of these things, you have some decisions to make in advance. And the best way to go about it is think about it really hard, make a plan, and then pretty much stick to the plan, and you don't have to think about that problem anymore. Eventually, you'll be confronted with an image that doesn't fit with your normal operating procedure, and that's fine. In that case, make an exception, alter your workflow and do some other sort of arrangement. But in general, I think we're going to come back over and over again to this lightly compressed JPEG, which in addition to its other advantages, like it can be understood by virtually every piece of software in the whole world, it's a format that is so ubiquitous that it's going to be in use many, many, many years from now. And it carries metadata very well. It carries metadata in both the IIM and XMP data fields. And that's kind of important for us in the Creative Commons space, at least right now, circa 2018, because many, many pieces of software still don't understand XMP metadata. IIM metadata is preferred, I hesitate to say overwhelmingly, but it is, cons it is preferred by many, many pieces of software that our ultimate users are likely to use. There are other options. On rare occasions, you might want to release a Creative Commons picture as a TIFF. It's absolutely lossless. The file's enormous. It carries metadata just fine. But again, TIFFs have been around forever. They'll be around for a long time, so they're good archivally. And there are all kinds of new formats that are popping up that are really specific to specific uses. WebP may take root as a standard file format for the web, or it may not. So it would be a very risky proposition at this point. Metadata is problematic on WebP. WebP will carry XMP metadata, not IIM. But at this point, software support for embedding or even reading metadata from WebPs is virtually non-existent. The FLIF format shows great promise for a number of reasons. Once again, we have no idea whether or not it will catch on. It too supports only XMP metadata, and at this point there's very little software support for it, so I doubt that it's really going to be a candidate. 
And then there are pings, the PNG format. It has a lossless option, as well as a lossy option. File sizes, quite frankly, are enormous compared to JPEGs. And in most cases, most webmasters prefer to use JPEGs to, to pings. Pings can carry XMP metadata, not IIM metadata, so they're slightly problematic there. And that format is completely open source, and that's a good thing. JPEG was originally encumbered by some patents. My understanding is that's no longer an issue, and the Creative Commons organization now recognizes JPEG as an open standard. So it's acceptable from a Creative Commons standpoint as a format for distributing Creative Commons pictures. And I might add that the, the fancy new formats, even though WebP is in fact open source from end to end, have not been recognized yet. Uh, excuse me, none of them have been recognized yet by the Creative Commons folks as acceptable formats. So there you go. Decide what sort of format and size you're going to make your distribution file. And size is a consideration. Some people release only really small versions of their images under a Creative Commons license, and they do it more or less as a promotional venture. Now, I must warn there that in most countries, different sizes of a picture, different resolutions of a picture are not considered different works. So if you, re if you release a 500 pixel wide version of your picture under Creative Commons, and someone can legally obtain a full resolution file for that photo, the Creative Commons license will apply to the full resolution version as well. So a bit of a word of warning there. But the process is simple. Think about all the considerations, make decisions that fit your needs, make a plan for hosting the pictures that fits your needs, build your templates and your workflows accordingly, and don't look back. Well, don't look back unless there's a specific exception that needs management. Otherwise, this stuff is pretty much effortless. It's just like any other workflow. There's just a couple of extra considerations along the way, and you can be contributing to the culture by releasing works under Creative Commons. Once again, I'm Carl Seibert. Please reach out in the comments here, or on the blog, or on social media. Tell us your Creative Commons story. And until next time, mind your metadata.